No, this is not sending. Huh. Oh. Okay. Eh? okay. What about now? No, no. Maybe this is not working. Yeah. Okay, let's try out. Yeah, I think now it's working. Let me try it. Oh, it's not? What are we using? Oh, okay. What are you doing that I'm no, not? It's okay. Thank yeah, that's what I was doing. It's not working super nicely. Huh? Forget it. I will use it. As long as so this is the screen that I will be sharing. Um, let, let me see this. Okay. Yes. I, I'm saying this is screen as long as I know so that I can see this and talk. Okay. 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 Is it fine for you? Yeah. So maybe we can just wait a couple of minutes in case mm -hmm. someone else arrives and then right. we'll start. So, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Chavera Mena Pineda. I'm a research scientist at INRIA and the leader of the Robot Learn team. And it is my pleasure today to introduce um, Ramesh Miai Distinguished uh, Lecture. So, Ramesh Jain is a professor. A Donald Brand Professor at uh, the School of Information and Computer Science at UC Irvine. Uh, he is an outstanding uh, scientist and uh, entrepreneur. I don't know how many companies he has participated in, many. Um, uh, he is also an entrepreneur, let's say, on the, on the science domain. And for this, he has been uh, awarded numerous times, including, for instance, the um, Stigamem Technical Achievement Award and an ICM uh, Distinguished Service Award. Um, he's also fellow with many uh, uh, scientific associations like IEEE or uh, IAPR. And nowadays, he is interested in uh, how data can help us with our uh, health and uh, taking care of uh, our, our health. And today, he's going to talk a bit about that, I believe, uh, so on this uh, idea of data-driven health and, and how AI, AI, like the sensors and specifically our smartphone can help us in, uh, in our healthcare. So without further delay, please uh, join me in uh, welcoming uh, Ramesh uh, for uh, his wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, very excited about uh, being here and discussing with you some, some of these topics that uh, I have been exploring for last several years, uh, almost a decade or more. Uh, I came to know or I became friends with Savi because of uh, my research in multimedia. Uh, and uh, uh, what I'm going to discuss here today is extension of or application of all the, not only multimedia, but everything that uh, is related to data that I have ever been involved and uh, now learning, trying to learn very fast about uh, many of the new things related to all that is happening in this area. Uh, as we all know, health is the most important factor for all of us. Uh, there could not be anything more important than health. But at the same time, when you start thinking about this, you find that uh, health care is broken almost in every part of the world. Every country is trying to work on improving their health care. And uh, when you start thinking about this, obviously, uh, you start thinking, why is this? And if you start thinking about health care, uh, what happens? Today, if uh, I have a health problem, what does that really mean? Uh, what problem do I have? Uh, if I'm having some uh, unusual feelings, if I'm having some kind of pain, uh, I always feel that there is a serious problem with my body. And because I feel that there is a problem, what do I need to do? I need to go to see a doctor. Yeah. And uh, because this paradigm is very popular paradigm and we all are very familiar with this. Whether there is a problem with our car, whether there is a problem with our computer or with our body, we do exactly the same thing. And in all these cases, the way it is fixed is almost always the same. If you take your car to a mechanic, they will try to find out what is the problem by analyzing all the data that they can get from you by asking you. Same thing happens to a doctor's place. When you go, they will start performing all kinds of tests on you. They will ask you all the questions. And based on that, the doctor will start becoming very similar to what a car mechanic will do or a computer mechanic will do. Yeah? And they will try to see what is the problem with you. That means in every case, you believe in repairing the problem. Many people uh, in the, not computers, but in health sciences, they started thinking about this and about 15 years ago, there was a term that people started using in at least in United States in health community, they started saying that we all use not health care, but we all work in sick care. We are not in trying to improve the health of people. We uh, are not taking care of their health, but we are taking care of their sickness. Yeah. And uh, when you start comparing that to other repair models, there is a serious problem. If your car has a problem or your house has a problem or your computer has a problem and you try to get it fixed, what happens? They will give you the cost estimates, how it is, how much it is going to cost you. And they will give you some kind of guarantees that if it does not work properly, uh, they are going to fix it again. Does that happen in healthcare? Can you even get any kind of anything close to a guarantee? The answer is no. Why is that? The most important thing that we have 
is treated so poorly. And the problem really lies in the way healthcare has evolved. We don't have time to go through the uh, how healthcare has evolved in almost all over the world. But we all know that today in healthcare, who are the most important stakeholders, who are the most important evil in the healthcare? Number one, I'm talking from uh, United States perspective, but the similar perspective is everywhere. Number one is who is going to pay for healthcare? We call them payers or insurance companies. Number two, who is going to fix the problem? We call them healthcare provider, hospitals, doctors, nurses, and all, all these things. Number three, who is interested in the health of people, your employers or your country? So the question is, healthcare has three main stakeholders. They are employers, healthcare providers, and payers. Where are you? All these three groups are interested in making money. So can we take and put a person at the center of this thing? Because what you will see in a second is that Health is about a person. Health is not about a population. And today, even when many of you who are doing research, when you start thinking about health, you always think about the population. And as we go through the talk, we'll address this point in a little bit more detail. But let's consider a very important point. Health is not sickness. Sickness is an event. It's an episode. It takes place at a particular time. How do you get diabetes? How do you get heart attack? Does it happen in a day? No. It's building up every movement. Your health continues 24-7. Your life continues 24-7. Sickness is detected when it reaches a particular level. Okay? So, if we want to really treat health, we have to treat it as a dynamic system, as a continuous system. Okay? And when we start considering this, one particular question that starts coming to mind is, when do people get best health care? What do you think? You all must have faced health-related issues many times, if not you, uh, somebody in your family, particularly somebody seniors in your family, may have faced these problems many times. What do you think? When do people get the best health care? Any guesses? Say it again. In a serious condition? When you are in a serious condition. Okay. What does that mean? You get health care when you are about to die. Or when they feel that if something urgent is not done, you are going to die. So when you are in ICU, intensive care unit. And what happens in ICU? There are all kinds of sensors that are connected to you. There are people who are observing you, the results of those sensors. Yeah. So when they say that they are observing you, what are they observing? They are observing all the sensors. They are observing all the output of the sensors. And they are decision makers. There are doctors available to you uh, there to immediately make the decision. Yeah. So what, what is ICU? You start seeing that everything is being measured about you. Yeah. So when you start thinking about this, you start asking the question, if you get the best health care in ICU, can we put you in ICU for all your life? 
as soon as you are born, some of my doctor friends say that that's too late. It should be before you are born. But uh, can we put you in ICU? Yeah. How do you like to be there? Hmm. You are thinking, this guy is crazy. No. You have these things there. You have this thing there. You have these things there. And your social media, everything that you are doing nowadays is being measured. Yeah. You can very easily be measuring right from the time that a child is conceived through mother. Yeah. And all your life, you are be, uh, continuously connecting this. And if you can do this, then how can you take care of the health of the person? Now, the question that immediately comes to mind is, how will we take care of a sick person? Okay. So let me... This question is very important. How do we take care of And what you are seeing here... What, what's happening? Media is not working or no. Sorry, then let's not worry about the video. Let's. Oh, it... Yeah. After why it takes a long time ago this particular quote. So uh, Oscar Wilde made this quote long time ago that society is a concept. All that matters are the individual human beings. What you are seeing is the world's busiest uh, intersection, Shibuya crossing. Uh, amazing intersection. Uh, it's an experience to see. Uh, as you see, it looks completely chaotic. Okay. But as every person in this has been empowered, they know what the rules are, when they should stop uh, walking and when they should do this. And so they, everybody is looking at the signal. There is no group action being done. Every individual is acting there. And th that's why uh, everything works amazingly smoothly. Mm -hmm. The message that you immediately start getting is, if we can empower individuals, then we can solve this problem. So the question that you immediately asking is, what does empowerment mean? Uh, if we want to empower people, we have to provide them the complete environment to do this. Now, when we are going towards this complete environment idea, let's consider a very, very important thing. All of us know homeostasis continuously going on in our body is the nature's best engineering. In fact, cybernetics was discovered based on homeostasis. Okay. Uh, if you go back to 1942 book by Norbert Wiener, where he started talking about uh, uh, communication and control in men and machine, you find that uh, th that's where uh, th this whole idea was discussed. And then the system theory started using homeostasis as the most important thing. That how our body regulates even the temperature and all these things. So, for example, uh, you saw a big difference between last uh, two days here. Uh, yesterday, the temperature was at about 80 degrees, and this morning, temperature was only 45, 46 degrees. Uh, I'm talking in terms of Fahrenheit. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry about that. But uh, th 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 that's what really happened. What is the result of this? You see that when the homeostasis doesn't work, people start using, taking clothes. They start wearing different types of clothes. Okay? And th that's what happens on the other side also. So you start taking actions depending on where your body can cope up with external environment. Okay? 
you have to take those actions and you follow those uh, actions uh, all the time. So e effectively, what we need to do is to empower people so that they can start taking actions and we will see the, how the homeostasis will come back in healthcare so that we can start providing information to people. There are three stages in this, providing information, doing some personal health navigation, and doing the disease management. These are the three stages in terms of health. Okay. Now, when we are starting to consider this, uh, a very important thing is, how do we implement this? And uh, I will first try to give you very briefly an uh, idea of how to do this. I am trying to condense a lot of different research related to different topics uh, here. So I will not be giving you details. I will be telling you the general things that are required to be done. Okay. So uh, let's start considering this. Number one is we all need health-related information. How do we get that health information right now? We go to Google, we go to all the things, but that's for the modern people. If you start looking at traditional people or for most part of the world, people do not understand, they do not want to read, they do not want to do anything, but they want to get the information. Yeah. How can we do it? If we can create an environment in which people can get accessible, trusted information. And how do people get accessible, trusted information? By talking to people. By talking to trusted people and listening to them, again asking the question, again do doing this. So through conversation in their natural language, they feel much more uh, convinced and comfortable when they are dealing in their own language. Okay? So how can we provide them all that information? And for that, there have been uh, many uh, talks about something like folk computing. Uh, and in this folk computing, the whole idea is how can we start providing information using multimodal means? Because when you want to get good conversation going, Text alone is not enough. You have to use speech, you have to use gestures, you have to use visual means and any possible other approaches. You have to be knowledgeable about the person you are talking with, provide information in their own context and uh, all this kind of thing. So th that's what you start doing. Now, when you start doing this, earlier we did not have tools. Mobile phones came and they started sending a lot of things for us. Now, in the last few years, we are all getting fascinated by Zen AI and LLMs. Can we start combining that with multimodal computing? And can we start combining this with uh, empathetic things in the context of mobile computing? Everybody is carrying mobile phone nowadays. It is impossible to find people who do not carry mobile phones. We are getting all the information through one device. Why can't we just modify that device slightly and provide this all over the world to di different people in their own context and they can start using this so that they can be getting accessible health information there. So this is one uh, aspect of providing health related information. The second aspect is the navigation aspect. Once again, look. let's look at our mobile phone. Whenever you have to go to some place, uh, for example, in the last two days that I have been here, I've been told to go to many different places. I never had any problem because I have my phone with me. I have the navigation system there. Why does the navigation system work? It's nothing but a cybernetic loop. It has GPS information. Based on GPS and based on where I am going to go, the system is continuously providing me feedback whether I'm going in the right direction or not. Okay? Not only just providing me one-time information that this is the route that you should take, and then you are on your own. No, 
you are continuously being guided. Providing you a map is like a doctor telling you, this is the program for you for the next six months. That doesn't work. Yeah. What works is having a navigation system. It is continuously telling you what to do. And if you want to do that, you can do that in the context of health also. You can start designing this navigation system based on these devices, based on your phones. And based on this, what you can start doing is uh, start developing the software which people in this room uh, are capable of doing. They have all the tools that are needed to start building that kind of software. Luckily, uh, International Standard Organization working with uh, SL7, which is the health level seven, uh, things, et cetera, are standardizing this architecture. They are coming up with a, a reference architecture so that anybody could use it. And the, the type of principle that they are using, I want to just present to you at very high level so that you know what kind of things go on in this. And that is uh, really based on what we discussed homeostasis. So this is based on perpetual augmentation of homeostasis. That means continuously understanding how your homeostasis is working and providing you feedback through lifestyle and telling you what to do. So this will guide you to a better health. Remember, we are not using the term sickness. We want to, you to be well and healthy. If there is a problem is starting to come up, take care of that as much as through your uh, uh, lifestyle. And there is a good reason why we want to do that, that you will see in a second. Yeah. Uh, but uh, th this is the system that can be developed and that can be available to everybody independent of your social and financial status, and it will be available to you free. Yeah. So when you start doing this, this is becomes a very, very useful thing. And this works because of a very simple reason. If you think about health, it's nothing but a navigation in multidimensional space. This multidimensional space means it could be thousands of dimensions, and it is thousands of dimensions. Okay, But the principles are exactly the same as the, the navigation system principle in two dimensions. What happens? There is a goal that you want to accomplish. This is the high dimensional space. You want to be in a particular goal state. Goal state is not that you want to be uh, getting rid of your sickness. Goal state could be that I want to run a half marathon or I want to run a marathon. I want to start playing tennis. I want to start doing this. And in order to do this, how should my health be? When you go to a trainer, that's what they exactly do. They know exactly what needs to be done after measuring all different your body parameters. That's what the system can do to all the biomarkers that are being measured by different systems. So th that's what you start doing here. So you have this initial state, uh, the, that's, what, that's where you are at the current state, and you want to be at the desired state. You go through different conditions, and you have a path there, and you can start coming up with this. The only problem is that this is a very complex and challenging problem. Now, what does that mean, that it's a complex and challenging problem? Let's look at a very simple, very interesting fact. Yeah. This is what World Health Organization came up with. What, what is this? What makes us healthy? Look at this. 10% is access to medicine or access to care. 20% is our genetics. 20% is environment. And 50% is our health behavior. That means lifestyle. Look at this number slightly more carefully. 50 plus 20, 70% is health, healthy behavior and environment. That purely depends on your lifestyle. Okay. Now, those of you who know genetics, they know that genetics has two components. 
the basic genetic structure, but then epigenetics, which tells, depending on what condition, which genes are going to manifest. About 5 to 7 percent of epigenetics is controlled by, again, your behavior and your environment. Okay. So effectively, if you think about this, 75 percent of your health is completely in your hand. You determine how healthy you are going to be. And when you start thinking about this, you also need to think how the society behaves today. We spend 88% of our health care funds on 10%. All the costs that we consider health care costs are this 88% we spend. On healthy behaviors, we spend 4%. So this 4% goes on 50%. Don't you see there is something wrong? Something we are doing wrong? And when you start considering this, effectively health factors are your food, your activities, stress, rest, relaxation, and things like that. Food is the most important thing. It is responsible for more than 50% of your health. That's why almost in every culture, they talk about let food be your medicine. Okay? And that's the most important factor. What does this mean is that if we want to consider a model for health, remember we looked at the repair model. What was the repair model? Repair model worked like this. Measure and collect all relevant data. When you go to a doctor, what do they do? First thing they will do is they will start using their stethoscope. A stethoscope has the only device that has not changed in the last 200 years. Okay. They are still using that device. Okay. Now it is going to disappear in the next few years. But so far they have been using that. That's how we characterize our doctor. Uh, and they will uh, do many other tests on you. They will ask you all the questions about you. Effectively, what they are trying to do is collect as much data about you as possible. And after collecting all that data, they estimate your current health state. They are using manually the estimation algorithms. That's what you call that they are doing diagnosis on you. Yeah. And after that, they come up with the recommendation engine or guidance. Yeah. Can we modify this uh, diagram a little bit to include the goal there? What do you really want to happen? And once you include goal, then you also start including and seeing that because you are measuring all the things, we can be in the closed loop model. And in this closed loop model, we can introduce two components. We are continuously measuring all these things because either because of what is happening inside the person, things are changing, or because of the external factor, things are changing. But independent of everything, things are changing, and you can start deciding how to take care of the person because you understand the person. You have a model of the person. If you don't have a model of anything, you never can predict and you could never prevent anything from happening. The reason that we create models in every field so that we can predict and we can prevent. In this particular case, we need to consider each person as separate person. Each person is unique and individual, and these are the component of the model that go through in this. Uh, I will not go through in detail, but this is what is be continuously being measured and all this behavior, your social behavior, your biological behavior through your heart rate, blood sugar content, uh, oxygen content, and all these things. And all these devices are now increasingly continuously doing this. So these are all the measurements that are being done. Uh, depending on where you are, what is the environment, etc., you can start coming in. You can take the genomic model and all these things could be starting. So you have this model being built over a long time, but you can also consider 
only the data for the last seven days or the data only for the last day and how the system has been behaving. Luckily, we have computing resources to start doing all these kind of things. So we start doing this. Okay? And once we start doing this, the system starts looking something like this. That block diagram that I showed, it is color coded to the same kind of thing where here is the data that's coming from all the sources, uh, your variable and uh, all kind of sources. You are analyzing that data and creating the personal model. Okay. This model is being used for health estimation and this model is being used with all the knowledge not only about uh, medical systems, but local regulations, local climatic condition, and what is available, what you can do, what you cannot do, and all those things. And based on that, you use a recommendation engine that you call guidance. Yeah? And this guidance is based on two things. What is your current health state and what's your goal? Okay? So effectively, this is nothing but a continuous cybernetic system. Okay, so you are going to think, start thinking. We are all data person. We are all AI people. What is cybernetic doing here? Look at this. This whole thing, when you start considering these diagrams, is nothing but based on all AI components. Let's look at different components, and then we will see that all these components that you are seeing here are related to AI or LLMs. Yeah. And th this is the conclusion not only of me, but uh, uh, international standards organizations working exactly on this kind of component. They are trying to standardize what will go on in uh, all these kind of things. So when you start looking at this, this is what is starts happening. Uh, in the disease management area, uh, so th this thing is how we can build the personal health navigation. Now in disease management area, because of different reasons, if you have become sick, then what do you do? So you start putting together these things. Uh, uh, you know all the diagnosis system and you know that in most cases, uh, people are now seeing better results using automated systems or AI systems than doctors. And this is becoming a very, very hot topic in medical areas. So how, what is missing? Based on all the observations, what is missing is the human touch in th these things. How can we bring human touch back? I don't know about here in France, but in the US, when I go to see my doctor, there is a very serious problem. Doctor is almost always looking at the computer screen. Very rarely looking at me. Very rarely having any communication. Okay. The communication is through computer. I can go on computer and I can get more detailed reports from them. But when I'm talking to them, I don't get that, that kind of report. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, very seriously, just about 15 days ago in some context, I told my doctor, uh, half jokingly, half seriously, that telemedicine th that she was using on a Zoom meeting with me. So I said that Zoom meetings are much better to interact with you because now you are appear that you are looking at me. I, uh, when I, I'm in your office, you are always looking at the computer screen. Yeah. Th that's kind of very funny thing. But what does this have to do with all the things that uh, we are talking about. This is very clear about uh, Zen AI, about uh, all the LLM type systems, about all the multimodality that we start talking about. Uh, currently, when uh, we talk about Zen AI and when we talk about use of LLM, and we even talk about using them in multimodal way. We are talking in a very limited sense. We are talking about using Zen AI only about creating images, creating videos soon. Yeah. Can we start using them as really understanding what's going on? 
in the environment. That's very different. In fact, all the images that you saw, or not all, but most of the images that you saw are created using ChatGPT. So ChatGPT has become extremely powerful in creating images. They can do a very good job. And soon they, uh, I, I will be creating the videos also using that thing. But when you start thinking about problem solving, particularly as complex as health, there are these three components. Number one is conversation systems with LLM. The biggest power that LLM brings are the conversation systems. Because they have enormous amount of knowledge collected through language. And they have become very, very good on text. Nobody could imagine that it will be so effective because of the computing power and about the volume of those things. And that's why whenever you want to have interactive natural dialogue, then we want to look at LLMs. Foundational models. People talk a lot about foundational models. And in languages, they have become very successful. Can we build foundational models for health? Health is the most multimedia system that you can ever imagine. Starting from your uh, basic biological parameters to your lifestyle, to your communication mechanism, to your emotions, everything is measured using different types of signals. The number of signals that you see in medical field or anything related to health or anything related to your life, it's phenomenal. How can we bring the technology that we have been using in uh, mul uh, multimedia in these cases? Multimedia has two uses. Number one is how do you extract information, combine this to understand the environment? That plays much more important role in health than you can imagine in any other field. Can we start doing that kind of thing? Can we start building foundational model using all this technology that is now available to us? But the third component is health agents. These are the problem solving component. When we talk about agents in the context of language, they are working in a very artificially constrained environment. They are working in the text environment. When you talk about agents in the real life environment, like autonomous cars, autonomous cars are considered one of the biggest examples of the agents right now. But really, if you start thinking about this, you can develop more complex things related to agents using health. In health, you need a lot more complicated understanding of what's going on than in case of autonomous cars you need. Okay. Uh, so how can we start uh, bringing these things here? There, uh, In our group, when we started looking at some of these things, first thing that we started uh, getting excited about was how can we bring being a uh, person from, who has dealt with the computer vision and multimedia, I became very interested in how can we bring empathy in healthcare. And when you start thinking about bring, uh, bringing empathy in healthcare, what is the most important thing? How are we going to even start to measure what empathy is? And we are going to see this uh, uh, the, just a bit more details there. But the first experiment or first uh, uh, work that we started doing appeared only about uh, seven or eight days ago in Nature magazine. Uh, but be, even before this appeared in Nature magazine, surprisingly enough, people became so interested because we talked in this paper. When I say we, there is a group of something like uh, 15 people who started interacting. 
uh, half of them are doctors and half of them are engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, and we started interacting and we started identifying how to measure empathy and how to measure all these things. And how can, are we going to start running those experiments? I'm amazingly surprised that there is already a big community who is starting to explore some ideas related to this. But the important thing is, how do we take this to start building conversational health events? What that means is, how are we going to start building these agents that are going to have the following capabilities? That will have personalized conversations, that will have behind the scene, there will be health agents who will be using the uh, kind of measures that we started talking about and continuous updates of the health information that's coming from any possible sources. If we start building this kind of thing, then we can start building this uh, foundation model. And this foundation model will be multimodal, but we also want to build these foundational models of individuals. The data that I showed in one of the slides about how do we model the person, is enormous volume of data being collected about individuals. And that thing becomes the foundation of the personal foundation model, which you are collecting uh, lots of data. And this data is about all kinds of things. This collects data about social interactions, biomarkers, behavioral data, and environmental data. And this is being now con considered to model the person. But then you can use this for specific cases. How is this person going to behave in relationship to this particular food item? Health is so complex, so complex that the same food item, if you eat in the morning, affects your body very differently than if you eat it in the afternoon or if you eat it in the night. And your body has the record, the data if you are collecting has the complete record of this. Circadian rhythm controls almost everything. Uh, e effect of exercise on me, effect of sleep on me, effect of all kind of stress on me. So how, how can we start bringing in all these things? And then when we start building this thing, there comes this, this thing that becomes extremely important. In this diagram, this is the traditional, uh, the lower part of this is what you see, whether you are working with the chat GPT, Gemini, or any system that you are working with, is at the bottom part. Uh, not the complete bottom part, except for the task executor, et cetera. But this is the communication. You can do uh, natural language translation uh, very soon. Uh, and in, in fact, I saw this. Uh, Amazingly working in entirely different domains. Recently, when I was in Tokyo, and I was uh, I wanted to get some information from the person on the uh, ticket booth. I went there, and they told me to ask me a question on my phone. Okay. They told me what system to run. So I I was speaking in English. The system they were uh, getting the question. In Japanese, they were providing the answer and I was getting the real-time translation of that kind of Now, said GPT takes this to the even next step. Okay. And we have implemented some of those things. I don't have time to show you many of those things. But we, we, we can start putting together those things. The problem is, when you look at the top part, this is not the data that can go with said GPT or Gemini. This is my personal data. There could be knowledge graphs that are representing the knowledge that is visual knowledge that is related to any particular area or particular specific task related to particular culture that cannot be put in LLM. So wh what you start doing is on the top thing, you have components 
that will not be the part of LLM, but they, that will be the part of the agent, problem solving. And that means if, if you uh, have been uh, following LLM and these things, most of the reasoning mechanisms that uh, LLMs use, and that's why they are so powerful, are usually put into uh, either the sequential mechanism or tree-like mechanism. So they call it tree of thought or sequence of thought. So that you break a problem into multiple steps. But that's usually not enough to solve real pro uh, uh, problems. And that's where what you start doing is you have to start thinking about what people have been doing in many different fields. And that is take a problem, break it into multiple solutions, uh, multiple sub problems, take each problem and go through your problem solving mechanism and see how are we going to solve that. Combine all those kind of things. So effectively, when you start doing this, you start putting together this task executor and available task. It keeps on solving those things Creates based on those things and gives the prompt to the people. So when you start putting together these things based on the top things, then you are solving a specific problem in the context of a specific people. That means you can start putting together these things in this following way, that in order to solve those particular things, this task executor and the uh, available task based on the uh, prompt list uh, become one of the most important component in problem solving. So take empathy. What does empathy really mean? Empathy could be considered that you are going to start using people's current emotions and you are going to respond based on what those emotions are. How do we do that? Text itself has some emotions, but as soon as you go to auditory mechanism, speech, your phone starts giving a lot more information. If you start looking at the face of a person and analyze face, that gives further more information. If you are, if you have access to person's health rate or perspiration rate or some other body parameters like thermal resistivity, then you can know even much more about how a particular person is feeling. And because you are measuring this continuously and you are in a conversation, you could be measuring these things and getting information about these things continuously. So you can start using all these things to start doing the uh, empathetic implementation of this conversation. We just finished a piece of work where this is what how the system is working. Uh, what is very interesting is that when we evaluated this thing based on several people and how the system was responding, system is responding using purely open set, but we are using the agent's work component to find out the emotions and do this. And when we are evaluating these things based on this, we find that based on manual evaluation, the results are so good that uh, most people consider that this is coming up with very good uh, results. Uh, the next example that I just wanted to share briefly, and we can talk uh, off, offline about this thing, uh, because the uh, 16 talks that I got are very poor. You will not be able to read anything. The idea behind there is uh, the following thing. In order to show how this, these components work, suppose that you go to the system and you say, I am feeling stressed. How stressed am I? Who can system tell you how stressed you are? What the system immediately says is, I have your record uh, because your watch system is being shared with me. Can I analyze your PPG data to find out how it says you are? 
system then goes and finds out what kind of algorithms can be used to find out a stress based on your PPG data. PPG data is giving you a heart rate variability. There are algorithms that can convert heart rate variability to stress. It, it can use those algorithms on your data, find out what happened to you, and tell you how stressed you are. If you say that I am very stressed, how can I correct this kind of thing? The system can go again in your log of data and can see what kind of activities you have been doing over the last one week. And based on that, it can tell you that some of these things that you are doing are leading to this stress. You can ask the question, how can I reduce my stress? It can tell you what kind of exercises you can do, or it can even tell you that you have been eating this kind of food. Okay? And this food leads to this uh, nutritious element or nutrition element, and this is what is causing those problems. Okay? So, in place of eating this food, if you replace this food by this food, yeah. your situation can be improved, etc. So, th this is how you can start combining all this data uh, there. What we are trying to do is we are trying to apply all these kind of things to metabolic diseases, that is, is diabetic, uh, heart rate problems. Uh, the next thing that we want to go towards are dementia and these things. Uh, we are thinking about uh, mental health in a very serious way. For mental health, there is the conversation has been always a big factor. So uh, here, that could be a very, very important thing. There are some people who are trying to think that uh, the biggest problem that seniors have is they feel very lonely. And because of that, they start feeling depressed. How can you start detecting that? And how can you start hel helping those things? So there are some uh, projects in our nursing school in that area. One of the areas that uh, I'm personally very interested in is related to food and nutrition. Our food plays the most important role. But we know the least about what to eat and what not to eat. What we know, according to all the experts, and I'm not an expert, but according to all the experts, 90% of that is disinformation. This information is intentionally created wrong information, which is done by different elements in this case, which is usually done uh, by advertisement industry, by um, uh, governmental uh, organizations in several cases, by religious uh, organizations in many cases, and so on. So how, how do we deal with this kind of thing? I very strongly believe that all these problems, and that's a separate topic for discussion, are now data problems. At one time, health was considered, long time ago, it was considered all other different things. But last 30, 40 years, health has been considered mostly biochemistry problems. In next 20, 30 years, health will be considered mostly data problem, it will be considered that biochemistry is a way to mechanize the thing and anatomy represents the structure of the body. Thank you very much. I would uh, love to discuss many of these things with you. So we have uh, time for questions for us and um... We have plenty of time for discussion as yeah. well. Um, also from uh, people in uh, Zoom, maybe if there are questions. Uh, so. Yes, may I, may I ask for a short question? Um, I'm uh, Philip Sanka. I'm uh, chairing uh, uh, chair in MI, uh, uh, which is called the uh, Deep Care, and I'm also uh, chairing. Uh, cross-disciplinary uh, projects, which is called uh, um, Health Companions. So thanks a lot for this uh, very uh, interesting and... Uh, embedded in the model to predict 
started the biomarkers. Uh, so, but the results were, so mostly they, it's all binary. So it's either like, okay, what's your weight? Is it above 50 kilos? Is it 50 kilos? What's your sex, female, male? What's your BMI above certain amount, less certain amount? And the same goes for other health-related issues like anxiety, yes, no, previous, uh, some cardiovascular issues, yes, no, it's all binary. So, and then even for binary labels, it's the performance, it's not there, it's like 0.8 AUC. So now, uh, given, you're very optimistic, let's say, about this, and you're, you're it's not me, I just tell you, say, so much, I'm a bit more pessimistic. Given also the trust issue in this, Thing, like where do you see or how far we are from really having something where you have this digital healthcare expert next you know, on your wrist? Now, th this is a very, very good question for the following reason. Uh, many, many systems that are trying to do build foundational model, uh, they are following more or less the approach that you mentioned. Uh, the approach is basically trying to find out whether you are overweight, underweight, or your heart rate is high or moderate or all this kind of thing, whether you have diabetes or heart disease and all this kind of thing. And based on this, they are trying to build this model. Just let's push this thing one step. This is nothing but the old fashion that if you have a hammer, Everything in the world is a nail because that's the only tool you have. If you have LLM based, if you know how to process text, what you are trying to do is you are taking all the data and trying to simplify it into text model. It is very easy to say that you, you are overweight or your uh, um, BMI is this uh, uh, high or low or all this kind of thing. It is very difficult to consider that in, in the continuous space because the problem is start becoming higher dimensional problem. Mm -hmm. Now, we, uh, let's remember that we are living in the days where when you talk about uh, uh, systems like uh, said GPT, we are talking about trillion parameters being controlled almost. Why can't we do that on the data in the continuous mode? And also, let's not consider symbolic uh, AI is very important. Much of the old, traditional AI was based on symbolic uh, approaches. And that's why what you just now described in foundational model was converting all the data to symbols and then doing the processing in symbolic domain. On the other hand, if you go back and uh, see most of the system that uh, complex system that are designed in engineering and they work successfully whether it is airplane or whether it's going to be autonomous cars they are working in the continuous domain they are working based on the feedback mechanisms that's what we need to bring in here and that's why i am very optimistic because i am seeing that th this happens we mo most of the people in ai don't even know what is the feedback control model and based on that, how, how, how it, it should work. Let's bring that thing there. And we now have all the tools and we have competing power to do that. Yes, please. There's a colleague online wants to ask oh. a question. I think he tried to speak before, but we can't oh, okay. hear. So, uh, Philippe. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, thanks a lot for this uh, very exciting presentation. I really love what you uh, showed because I'm showing a, a research here in MIAI, which is entitled Deep Care and uh, which focuses on the patient's uh, empowerment. So uh, yeah, I was very happy. Oh, very good. Very yeah, good. I was very happy to see that uh, this is one of your key uh, uh, themes of, uh, of research, and uh, I love what uh, all, all that you uh, that, that you described. I would have a, a remark and a, a question. Uh, my remark uh, is about uh, the potential uh, interest of AI for populational health. Uh, in uh, one part of your talk, uh, you uh, described that health was about individuals. Uh, that's right, uh, but it's also about population. And I think that uh, populational health uh, is emerging as something which maybe 
very interesting and useful in order to uh, promote preventive uh, medicine. So I, I would like to have your, your comment on that. And I think it, it's not, a, uh, I mean, it, it can be combined. I don't think that they, they should be uh, opposed. Uh, and then my, my question would be about uh, how you see the uh, organization that would be required in order to facilitate uh, the, uh, the arrival of uh, what you showed and uh, of which really uh, I'm sharing the objectives. Because it means a cooperation between uh, physicians, nurses, uh, health providers, all the stakeholders that you that you mentioned, and of course uh, each of us. And I'm not sure that uh, this can be uh, done uh, efficiently uh, if all these stakeholders are uh, working independently. So, what uh, do you see about the necessity of uh, cooperation between these stakeholders? And by the way, how could AI perhaps facilitate this cooperation? Why, you have one question there or 100 questions? <laughs> you pick up the one you like. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, well, uh, you have many questions there, many, many questions. Uh, let me uh, start by the last question that uh, you said, that uh, how, how do you... Uh, uh, start facilitating cooperation among these people. Now, you cannot start this kind of cooperation by telling everybody to start working together because there is a big language gap. The la when I say language gap, I do not mean the English and French gap. I mean the, the language gap between doctors and uh, even nurses and uh, uh, engineers and all these people. We all use different languages, we use different tools, etc. But luckily, uh, if, if you look at uh, the way things are evolving, uh, I run into many, many doctors uh, who know a lot more about what's happening in AI than I do. Uh, in, in fact, I had uh, uh, two PhD students who were really MDs. They were already had finished MD and uh, they were trying to do PhD with me. Okay. And uh, I was, uh, I used to say this to them and they used to consider that as a joke. I used to say that uh, I am learning more from you than you are learning from me. And this, that, this was a fact because uh, in my education system, when I was growing up in India and, and uh, it, it studying engineering side, I did not have to take a single course on biology. And then I decided to start working in health. I had absolutely no idea about how the body works and what are the different th mechanisms. And I, I did not know any anything in biology. Okay. So th this situation is improving very, very fast in this, but we have to start building the communities. Okay. And uh, we are, we are already making that happen. For example, that one paper that I mentioned to you, there were uh, uh, three p faculty members from Stanford Medical School. There were uh, uh, people who had worked or led groups in uh, Google Cloud uh, projects. There was a, a person who directs uh, all the information technology effort in National in Institute of Standards. And in the beginning, we used to spend a lot of time uh, discussing things that uh, only some of us knew. But slowly, we started coming closer and started speaking the same language. So uh, it's not going to happen in a day, but uh, slowly it's, it's starting to happen. And younger generation is much better because uh, even the doctors, they all use mobile phones. And because of that, they are all getting educated in many things related to AI and uh, all these things. Yeah. So uh, we are already seeing emergence of people uh, who are well-trained and who are interested, who realize that uh, we have to break these barriers. Yeah. These barriers in the disciplines are as powerful as the geographic barriers are. Yeah. And uh, we will have to break those barriers. 
but that, that's going to happen once people realize the benefits of that. Okay, thank you. I completely agree on that. Uh, and here in our lab, we have uh, many people who are both medical doctors and PhD in the mathematics or uh, mm -hmm. computer science. And uh, I agree, it's very important to uh, build a common language and uh, being, in, being uh, our research center is inside the hospital of Grenoble. And I must say that this uh, facilitates things quite, quite a lot. So thank you for uh, putting this uh, question of common language uh, together. Uh, which other question you want me to answer? Uh, perhaps a comment about uh, the uh, potential of uh, populational health uh, as a complement uh, to uh, individual health. Uh, in fact, I'm a very big believer in that. And uh, in order to show that I'm a big believer, uh, you will, uh, now I will tell you a funny thing. Uh, most of the time I wear uh, these full sleeve shirts. And the reason is very simple. I wear two watches, uh, as you can see. Uh, uh, in both my hands, I wear watches. I have this aura ring. And, uh, and uh, from time to time, I even wear continuous glucose monitoring system mm -hmm. because they are collecting all the data uh, about me. And uh, uh, I, we are developing tools. And th that's why I wear all these things because we can develop tools to start put, putting together these models. We started using the term foundational models only recently. Earlier, we used to use the terms like personal chronicle, where we are collecting the personal chronicle of all the data and applying causality and uh, all the reasoning mechanism to build the personal model. You raised the issue of personal and population health. They are very closely related, very clearly. But currently, the focus has been on population health. And the, the fundamental difficulty with population models is I am considered a sample of a population. Which population do I belong to? I am a person who lives in California, but I am of Indian origin. Okay. Now, my food habits have been very different and have been changing all through the life. I have gone through different mechanisms. So when you are trying to prescribe me or put me in a particular group, which group are you going to put me into? On the other hand, if you start collecting, the, and that's why when in population model, in all evidence-based uh, medicine, when you try to do any of these experiments, the most fundamental problem is how do you decide which group should be applied to me? Because no individual is represented or can be represented by one particular population. Yeah. So uh, can we adopt the exactly opposite approach, which I jokingly quoted Oscar Wilde, but Data warehousing is exactly the same problem. Let's collect data for as many people as you can in the living lab situation. And once you have that data, then you can start thinking, how do we form different types of populations? And uh, you are always going to see synergy between population model and per, uh, individual model, because you, you may not have any guidance for an individual then you will find the closest population and you will drive the guidance from there. Uh, in fact, what is funny is that many of the learning techniques that are being developed follow some of these principles. Okay, thanks a lot. I think we, we share the same vision of cooperation between uh, individual and population health. Thanks again. You said that uh, ninety percent of the information we get about food was disinformation. Do you have examples of disinformation and good information on the what you should or what should not eat? Uh, I, I can show you both that talk about this, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, let's not consider that. I can give you, but uh, let's consider a very simple thing. How many? 
many times do you hear that uh, I'm going to use it, one of the latest examples. Coconut water is good for you. Or coconut oil is good for you. In the last few years, everything related to coconut has become good for you. Okay. You have give yourself a little bit of time and you are going to find out that coconut is bad for you. The same as the people who are telling you that coconut is good for you, will they start telling you coconut is bad for you? Yeah. Same thing has happened to everything. You hear debates about what uh, eggs do for you, what meat does for you. Yeah. That's why all the different fed uh, uh, food diets start coming in. And after some time, we change those diet models, and etc. The reason is very, very simple. And it, to some extent, related to what the system we are. Food analysis from that these new systems. Now, new systems have very complex effects on you. But the advertisement agencies want to take some sound bite from that. And they use them in a way so that you will really be misled. Uh, advertisement agency, uh, you have to be extremely careful when they will say you that this is a uh, lower calorie item. It may be only 1% lower calorie. But technically, they are right that it's lower calorie item. But they, they will not tell you that it's only 1% lower calorie item. And th that information, when you use, is, hear that information multiple times, you start thinking that th this will be good for you. Think a, a very common example. You go to any place for breakfast. Yeah. What are the common things you see there? Cereal. Do you know how bad are cereals for you? Just go and read books on YouTube. Most of the cereals are nothing but carbohydrates. About uh, 100 years ago, nobody used to eat cereal. But uh, it's only the advertisement industry or the marketing tool that came up with it. We need an endowment. They play equally important role in giving you this information. Uh, I grew up in India. There are many of you who know India, they will know that my last name indicates name of a religion. And those people are very strict vegetarian. I am not, but most of the Jains are very strict vegetarian. Now that's considered a very hypothetical situation. The street I am going, let us say there are three houses next to each other. In one house, there is a Jain family live, the next house, there is a Muslim family live, and the third house, there is a specific Hindu family. Then we'll say, I will grow up learning and this, this information is put in my head from early, from the first day I am born, that don't eat any meat or don't eat any fish or don't eat any of those things. They are bad for you. Now that's bad according to religion, not according to health. A Muslim family will say, don't eat pork. Yeah. The typical Hindu family will say, don't eat beef. They are living in the same thing. Are they considering the health factor? No. These are the factors that have been conveyed to them through non-health means. That's different. Yeah. And thank you for the presentation. Um, the uh, very complex and, uh, and great system that you described for the data-driven health uh, seems to have a lot of privacy implications. Is that something that's only looked for? Because of course, there are some computational needs uh, implied by processing such data. But at the same time, you might not disclaim this information, which means a lot about yourself. 
Sorry, the misuse of the uh, phrases. Uh, it, 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 it can be more explicit. I did not get uh, exact. If you, want, that you yeah. want. if you want to build such a such a big system involving uh, gathering the health data about the person, processing it, and making links between all the features, um, this needs um, this implies some privacy uh, implications, right? About uh, how do you collect data of people? Where do you process it? And who uh, would, is it a company in your sense? Is it yeah. the government that should process it? Give me, give me a second, please. Yesterday, I learned a new term. And uh, that term was coming here was very interesting to me because uh, Tavi mentioned that uh, Bill Crowley is here. And uh, I did not uh, know that Bill was here. Uh, I used to interact with him in, are you ready? <laughs> in 80. Uh, and after that, I had not met. So when we were discussing, we discussed some very exciting topics. And this topic came up in, in this. And uh, I took a position that, that I normally take. I said, uh, social aspects and scientific aspects are different things. As a scientist, we should first feel this scientific aspect. Once scientific aspects are solved, then the social aspects should be introduced to see what should be developed into technology and uh, how we should go forward. And that. Yeah. If we start using the social aspect, then we are not doing science. Yeah. Then we are doing religion, really. Yeah. Because social aspects keep on changing, and social aspects are different in different societies. Yes. So he used the term, he said that uh, uh, he uses that term insecure by design. He said what you are saying is that you want to design systems that are insecure by design. But then you can take that design and implement on top of that system. So I told him that I will start using this to post uh, insecure, insecure by design. And uh, that, that, that's what we want to do. Right now, we are in the phase of understanding how each individual body is functioning. Now, I completely understand that it has very serious uh, privacy issues. But when we start implementing this, that time we will be done. Uh, we are just coming out of COVID. During COVID, privacy rules started changing in different parts of the world, in different ways. When it comes to your life and that situation, uh, privacy always takes second place. Yeah. Are there other questions? Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Jane, for, for the like a very interesting presentation starting from of course the idea about uh, what the present status of healthcare is and what the future might be given the fact that we can use the advancements of uh, data driven modeling artificial intelligence and uh, large language generative models um the only thing that i felt a bit uh, let's say abstract which i want to discuss more is the uh, context of empathy because I mean, um, given the idea that, uh, yes, uh, machine or artificial intelligence tool can interpret everything given uh, like a, a large amount of metadata, but uh, empathy is something that is considered human. So even though, of course, uh, there could be a very huge potential to integrate empathy in this uh, existing infrastructure of healthcare in the present status and in the future, uh, or what the future of healthcare looks like, but doesn't it make uh, the contribution of the human element less, or let's say, a bit obsolete? Uh, you're asking a very interesting question in the following sense. 
Uh, empathy is definitely a very human quality. Uh, can we implement it, it perfectly? The answer is very difficult. We don't know. And uh, if you start assuming that uh, something is very human quality and that's why machines will never have it, yeah, uh, then the answer is obvious. Yeah. Because it's human, it's going to remain human. But the question that people start, start asking is, like the philosophers, what is human? Well, uh, so when you start talking about empathy, uh, psychologists have been trying to break it into multiple levels. Yeah. And what are those each levels that you are going to start considering? And how are you going to implement those things there? So, uh, there, there are some elements that are very, very interesting. Uh, have you heard about the system called ELISA or ELISA? Uh, anybody else has heard of the system called ELISA in this room? Mm. That's surprising. Uh, uh, ELISA was the first AI system developed. The person who developed it was Wise and Mao. He did his PhD at MIT. You will be surprised what I am going to tell you. He did his PhD in 60s. Yeah. Uh, and he developed a system called ELISA, which is considered the first AI-based system or conversation-based system, the first natural language-based system. It used to have uh, the, all the interactions at that time, as you know about the Turing machine, were through typewriter. Yeah. So he developed a system where you could go to a system called ELISA, and you could share your problem. Yeah. After he finished his PhD mm, on, on this topic, he completely stopped talking about this system. And he said, this system could never be developed. And the reason that he said that these systems should never be developed, he was scared. He said that the data that he collected showed that people will not share their most intimate feelings with any other human being, but they were sharing those feelings with Elisa. They will tell how they feel about their mother. They will tell how they feel about their, their girlfriend. Yeah. And they will not be able to share those feelings with anybody else. Yeah. So there is something when a human is interacting with machine. Because humans are also afraid that other humans are going to judge them. Is that part of empathy? That makes a very interesting point. That, 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 it's like as we, if we, if we say in a, in a context of a feeling onion, there are few details which are completely personal to everybody. And uh, if the solution to a certain problem relies talking about those problem or those core, core uh, existing information that can only be done more, let's say, with trust to a machine rather than a human. I mean, it's a debatable point, but uh, they, I'm leaning they, more they, toward... You use some magic word there. Empathy and trust uh, are very closely related. Uh, but they are different. Uh, it, it's very, very interesting to start seeing uh, it, it, the more recent version of Eliza is movie called Her. Have you heard of the movie Her? It came out in 2014. Very good movie. Uh, if you haven't seen it, go and see it. Okay? Uh, it's available at every place. Where a person falls in love with uh, Siri. And his whole life is controlled by Siri. Hmm. And how, how that happens? Are there any questions for Ramesh? I was checking it on Zoom. All right, so I think we can thank Ramesh yeah. again for the talk and the discussion. Okay.
and then I, he will be around uh, today and tomorrow. So please send out an email or or him an email if you want to uh, to meet and discuss. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I can assure you that uh, I uh, I am uh, trying to learn as much as in this area. Uh, these are very complex areas. Mm -hmm. That that's why I decided to become emeritus because in the uh, uh, U.S. and uh, my university also uh, there is no requirement that you have to retire. But I decided to retire three years ago so that. I can spend my time doing what I am doing, yeah. or what I enjoy doing. So, what one of the things is is to discuss with people to understand many of these issues. They they can only come through these interactions. No. Okay, guys. Thank you. Ça va Oui, toi Ça va. Bon. Toi aussi. <rire>